Our topic is the judgment, and this is within the framework of our ongoing study, Future Events. We've talked about already an introduction to future events or prophecy, the rapture, the tribulation. And of course, there is a, a significant component of the tribulation dealing with judgment. But what we're talking about here now is a specific future event, an event that comes at the end of the world. And it is an event of justice or of God setting things right. So let's start with this as kind of an introduction or a, let's just imagine a hypothetical conversation. You're sitting with someone and you're doing your best trying to evangelize or talk to them about the Lord. And you're warning them that God will judge sin. And a person looks back at you and says, well, I don't really understand how a good and righteous God can possibly judge sin. I don't see how that could be right. In fact, what they might feel is, I, I think a gracious God should just let things go. He should just forgive and not worry about or not bring into account these different sins. And so the conclusion goes, I can't believe in a God like this. I can't believe in a God that would judge sin in this way. How would you proceed in a conversation like that? Where would you carry the discussion? And what are some of the biblical foundations you can make or arguments that you can point out, just truths that you can highlight to help this person appreciate the biblical theology and the biblical teaching regarding judgment? I'll start out with this. Judgment is part of the entire storyline of Scripture, and that's critical. Recognizing that as we read through the story of Scripture, it's everywhere. It's constant. And, and you can take nearly any period of the biblical story and see significant teaching about the reality of judgment. We can go back to the very beginning, starting in the garden, so that God warns Adam and Eve if they disobey his commands, they will be judged. Specifically, they will die. They do, of course, sin. And they are, of course, judged. So that you see in Genesis 3 a curse. And the curse itself then is the very first instance of judgment, but it's immediate and it's absolutely connected to sin. When people sin, they do face judgment. Starting from there, though, you move immediately forward in the biblical story and you see that sin begins to proliferate or to increase, to multiply. And so when Cain kills Abel, there's immediately judgment brought on him. When the wickedness of humanity on planet Earth in, ends up filling the Earth and making it into a, a chaotic and unlivable place, God washes the Earth clean through the flood Immediately after the flood, though, the sin of Noah's sons leads to another curse. And then you have the Tower of Babel and the judgment that comes through that. And it's just continuing on as you walk through the story at every stage. Judgment for sin. Judgment for more sin. More sin, more judgment. If you move forward very far in the story to the Exodus, you come to Pharaoh's hardness of heart and Egypt's unwillingness to let Israel go. And for that reason, Egypt is judged. You see the nations surrounding Israel that are judged for their sin and in places throughout the Old Testament, but particularly I think of Isaiah 13 to 23, it's called the Table of the Nations. It's this extended list or the, the little apocalypse, extended list of nations that are judged over and over all of these different nations and the judgment that falls on them. Or you can think of other places like Jonah going to Nineveh and declaring that in a few days they will be judged. It's this extended pattern that, that across the world, those who reject God will be judged. But actually, all of this comes into tighter focus with Israel. And you find that those who have received the greatest truth about God are those who are held to the highest account. 
So you see blessings promised to Israel if they will be faithful, but also judgment if they will not. And this is appearing like in the end of Deuteronomy, I set before you a blessing and a curse. Which will it be? Well, you watch Israel's history. And as they travel through the wilderness on the way to the promised land, they sin, they face judgment. The period of the judges is this cycle going around and around of wickedness. Well, with each repetition of the cycle, God shows mercy, but there's also judgment when they sin. You can go forward to the kings and with the period or the cycle of the kings and those who, quotation marks, did evil in the sight of the Lord all the way through. So many of them did. Each time judgment falls. And of course, the climactic expression of judgment is the Babylonian captivity. You can read a summary of this in Daniel 9 in Daniel's prayer. And the confession that God is acting justly and righteously to judge his people. Because look, look at how they have lived. And in fact, the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, the Old Testament ends, at least in our canonical order, with this statement, lest I come and I strike the land with a curse. I mean, there is this sense all the way through, sin must be judged. Now, you might expect the New Testament to turn and move away from all of this dark and depressing side into something hopeful and optimistic and encouraging. But actually the theme of judgment continues. So you find both John the Baptist and Jesus warning that judgment is coming. John says, Matthew 3, he will clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn. The chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. It's sharp. Jesus warns similarly of judgment, and he actually is part of the judgment. When you see Jesus cleansing the temple, it's very evident that Jesus has come to judge. And as we'll see in a bit, Jesus is the judge. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, watch the apostles preaching, I think particularly of Acts 2. And as Peter proclaims to people that listen the, the, the gospel, and hope and the reality of Jesus as Savior, he also warns them that judgment is soon to come. And, and the warning goes, repent now while you have the chance, because very soon what we face is blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the, turn, the sun turned into darkness, the moon turned into blood. So here comes the day of the Lord, repent now. Now, move into the epistles and talk about theology as we express it in the epistles, and, and you'll find that this theme is still here. So that when we're talking about judgment, we can link this directly to salvation. Why do I need to be saved? Or what's the concept of being saved? And we kind of lose the concept because we just use the wording without thinking about the underlying meaning. But saved, you're delivered from something. It's, it's as though you're drowning and someone pulls you out before you go down. To be saved is to be rescued. What am I rescued from? I'm rescued from God's righteous wrath. And you can see this particularly walk through the book of Romans. The wrath of God has been revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. But you can just walk through Romans looking for this pattern of wrath, and it's everywhere with the recognition that sin demands a solution because sin demands wrath. All sin must be judged. It's only righteous that it would be. In fact, as we will continue to unpack, the whole framework of the New Testament is that God's wrath is coming and that the answer to that wrath can be none other than Jesus, the propitiation, centered again in Romans, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Jesus stands in as propitiation to deal with the righteous wrath of God. In fact, this topic of judgment is at the core of the gospel. Apart from this concept of judgment, there is no gospel and there is no hope. But what we're pointing to here is not just the concept of wrath or the concept of judgment, God's righteous judgment against sin. We're really looking further towards a future event. 
And the future event we're talking about is a specific time of judgment. So maybe instead of saying judgment as a concept, we might say the judgment, meaning an event. And the concept here, the idea here would be in the future, there will be a time of judgment, a, a focused judgment that falls upon the earth because of sin. Now, these are linked. Think of the pattern with the judges in the Old Testament. And there's a cycle, just an exhausting cycle of sin and rebellion and judgment. And it goes about and about. Or you see all the way through the kings. And as I said earlier, they did evil in, in the sight of the Lord. And that continues on with a constant warning. The prophet saying, you will be judged. Sin is always going to be judged. You must be judged. It's kind of the constant warning. It's around the corner. It's around the corner. And of course, there are hints already of judgment within the judges. You see judgment falling across through the kings. You see judgment falling. But there is also this strong sense of kind of a delayed judgment. In other words, you're experiencing some of the judgment, but the full outpouring of God's wrath is held back mercifully. And the framework for that is that God is giving an opportunity to repent. So the judgment is withheld. The judgment is restrained. There's extra time given. The judgment is coming. It's around the corner, but he's waiting. And that concept, I think, can be extended right across to the future judgment. It can be extended to the final and, and absolute judgment of the world. That what we ought to express or understand here is that the history of the world is so full of sin. That just as God delayed across the period of the kings and he waited until finally the full judgment fell at the exile, in a similar way, you can, just, you can just stretch that across the entire history of the world to say, through human history, we have been storing up judgment. But the judgment will come. It will fall. When it falls, it will be crushing. You see pointers to this already in the Old Testament. You, you see a sense of judgment like a courtroom, Daniel chapter 12 describes everyone who has died coming awake or awakening, coming to life. But some awake to everlasting life, some to awake to shame and everlasting contempt. In other words, there's a division. There are two different categories here, two different types of people or two different types of fate that they face depending on their responses to God. Jesus extends the same warning, and now we're talking about John chapter 5. Jesus warning that the hour is coming when all of the dead will awake, when they will hear the voice of the Son of God. And that itself, I think, is very striking that Jesus is the center of this judgment, or Jesus is the one who will call all men to account. All men will awake, they will hear his voice. As the Father has life in himself, he has given the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. It's very parallel to Daniel chapter 12. I think intentionally parallel to that language. And Jesus continues on. I am the one who judge, judges, my judgment is just. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. Jesus Christ is the future judge, and all of humanity will be judged righteously in his judgment. But I think this pattern of the coming judgment leads us to ask some other questions. And there are a number of things we might want to know about this coming judgment. For instance, who is the judge? What will the judgment be like? When will the judgment happen? What is the judgment based on? What is the purpose of God's judgment? In all, those res all of those respects, I, I, I think we have questions that we want answered, and we need to have answers based on Scripture. How would we understand the judgment or the future judgment? in the full context of scripture and what this means. Well, let's start with the first question, who is the judge? 
And what does this look like in terms of the coming judgment? A couple of things we should say here. First of all, who is the judge? Well, only God can judge the world. That should be clear enough. And we see this, of course, illustrated across scripture. So Abraham confesses, the judge of all the earth will do right. Psalm 9 talks about the Lord establishing his throne for justice, and he, judge, he judges the world with righteousness. Revelation 20 describes God as the one who's sitting upon the throne, and specifically as the judge. And you can read about this particularly in Revelation 4, the throne, the throne, the throne. But it's throne in the sense of his reign as king, as well as throne as the judge. And you see both of them linked together, and we'll see that pattern as we keep on going. Peter also talks about the Father as the one who impartially judges according to each one's deeds. In all of these cases, it's very evident that it is God who is the only rightful judge. Only God can judge. Okay, this is where it gets interesting, though. Because though, and, and yes, God is the only rightful judge, we also discover that Jesus judges the world. And, and of course, I think you can see where the logic of this goes. If the only person who could rightfully judge the world is God himself, it's a divine right, it's, it's only through divine authority, who else would you trust? And yet when I get further in the New Testament, I discover that Jesus is the judge, that Jesus can righteously judge the world. It's telling me something about Jesus. Let's watch how this develops and then let's fill out the idea. So John 8, 16, Jesus says, if I judge, my judgment is true because I'm not alone. I am the father who sent me. Okay, so connected so closely, inseparably actually, with the father that he is able to speak of judgment because God judges and because Jesus' judgment is righteous. Here it is in Acts, Acts 7, 13, 17, 31. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Okay, well that sounds fair enough and straightforward enough so far. We know that God is the judge. We've already seen in multiple places that God will judge the world. Okay, fair enough. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. So God will judge the world through a man. What man? Well, Jesus Christ, the full humanity of Christ. And Jesus will judge the world. 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick and the dead. There's some ambiguity in here. Who will judge the world? God and or the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the ambiguity is just accepted as it is. God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the world, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. However, this language right here, his appearing, is really linked to Jesus' return. I mean, if anything, the argument here is that Jesus is the one who will judge. Jesus is the eternal and righteous judge of the world. Now, you can see, as I said already, and as I pointed to, that the logic of this goes in a very strong direction. If the only person who could rightfully judge the world is God, and if Jesus is the eternal or future judge, the final judge, then there's no question here that this is an argument, a very strong argument for Jesus' deity. Who can he be? How can he be anything less than God himself? Jesus will judge the world. Only God can judge the world. Jesus is God. There is a final pattern and the extension of this pattern is that together with Christ, believers will also be part of judging the world. Now, I have to protect the logic I just used a moment ago to recognize that. To say believers will judge the world does not prove that believers are God. In fact, the notion of this is that it's believers judging alongside of God himself. God is the authority. God is the judge, the central judge. God is the one who judges the world. I think the concept of believers part in that 
has two connections and one is a union with Christ concept that we've seen in other places so that what is rightfully Christ's what rightfully belongs to him is now shared with those who are his followers because we are united with him along with that though is the idea that if you walk through these patterns we are not judging in the same way that Jesus judges. We are not the judge. And there would be the difference. Who is the judge of the world? Who is the one who sets forth justice? Well, God alone. But we judge together with him. I think the concept is that we stand together with him and we agree with, we affirm, we are part of the decision that he makes. But we simply share in that judgment. And if we look at several passages, we're going to see this kind of concept. So Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says to them, specifically as a group, Verily I say unto you, you have who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also will sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You can follow this concept of thrones or of believers reigning together with Christ, and you can find this concept of reigning together with Christ all over Revelation, actually all over Scripture. So this is a very strong pattern. What's interesting about the concept of thrones or reigning together with Christ is how this passage links that. Here are the thrones, but part of the thrones are the reigning, the kingly sort of concept. It's inseparable from the judge concept. So part of reigning upon these thrones is also to judge together. With Christ. And you see that illustrated further in 1 Corinthians 6, know you not that we shall judge angels. So the pattern goes, just as believers share in Christ's reign, just as believers share in Christ's victory, just as believers share in the the, 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 the righteousness of Christ and imputation, our union with Christ means that there are all of these connections together with him. And so his victory has become our victory in the same way. Jesus Christ as the judge is a judgment that's shared so that we also will be part of this judging. We share in his reign. We share also in the judgment. Now that's the first of the questions, who is the judge, to which the answer went, it is surely God. God is the only righteous judge and the only possible judge. But we also discover Jesus Christ is the judge and ultimately believers are part of the judgment. Second big question, what will the judgment be like? And we could ask a number of questions underneath this question. For instance, just a, a visual of it. What does it look like? We see description in Revelation 20, and in other passages as well, of a throne. And Jesus talks about also in Matthew 25, I will sit upon a throne. And so the, the picture of a, a great court set, and at the centerpiece of it, this is a strong idea in Revelation, the throne with God upon it, and he is the center of it all. Okay, so there's a throne. That expresses, I think, authority. It expresses that he is entirely in charge, that he's the center of this. Revelation in two different places further describes this throne as white. And the concept of a white throne would be to say it is pure or it's total and, and pure justice. In other words, there's, there's nothing about this judgment that is corrupt in any way. But you can expect, you can know, that when God judges, he always judges justly. And finally, we could just recognize another description that happens in two passages describing a judgment seat. This is slightly different language, but it's using pictures from the Roman law court and the culture of justice in Rome. And so the picture is of a Roman courtroom and the way that would be set up, the place where the judge sits. Again, related to the concept of a throne. At the same time, I want to push back a little bit. If we bring in too many categories from our modern concept of justice or of courtrooms, then I think we lost something. And the reason that we would want to adjust that, modern courtrooms, by and large, rely on an adversarial process 
Okay, the way the courtroom is set up, you have lawyers advocating on behalf of the client. You have other lawyers that are prosecuting, so they're bringing charges. And you do that because you want to, to make sure that you got both sides of the story. And so the judge needs to hear evidence or argument from both sides, and the hope is that both by both sides presenting their view, maybe we'll come out closer to the truth. It's an accountability thing. I think what's so interesting about Scripture's description of judgment is that there is no adversarial process, there is no back and forth, because there is no need of balancing or arriving at the truth through people presenting their sides. The reason you don't need that is because you have a king and a judge who just knows the truth. He simply knows what is right. Isaiah 11. He shall make of him quick understanding of the fear of the Lord. This is the Messiah. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Nobody has to present evidence to the Messiah. He just knows. With righteousness will he, will he judge the poor. He shall reprove with equity on behalf or for the sake of the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. He with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. Faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. I can highlight three components that make his justice so unique. Number one, he needs no evidence. He knows all things. He himself is the perfect and total enforcement of his decision. He absolutely can bring about his justice. And third, he will be uncorruptible. No one could bribe this judge. This is no law court where the decisions are kind of in question so that you know, people come and they can buy cleverness or by twisting the truth or by presenting one side of the information, they can kind of shift the decision and maybe they can slide through. You won't slide through this law court. This law court is not trying to figure out what to do as though the king sits on the throne and he thinks and he struggles. And, mm, this is a difficult decision. How will I handle this justly? He knows. He immediately knows what is justice and he deals with that accordingly. So the first thing I think we want to adjust in our thinking about this law court is the absolute authority of the judge. We want to recognize this is no law court where things are discussed and people try to figure out decisions. But this is a law court where the decision is absolute and always perfectly righteous. A second thing to adjust about the law court is not just the judge and how he behaves himself. But now let's turn our eyes outward. We've seen the throne, a white throne. We've seen a king sitting upon it who judges perfectly in all righteousness. But now if we turn our eyes outward and we look at who stands before the throne, the imagery expands further still. Jesus talks about Matthew 25 all the nations gathering before him. John 5, 28, all who are in the tombs will hear and come out to face judgment. Acts 17, 31, Jesus will judge the world. Acts 10, 42, all of the living and the dead will come. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 5 that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In Revelation 20, 12, all of the dead, great and small, will stand before this throne. In other words, there is no one, no one at all, who escapes the judgment. The entire world faces this judgment. And finally, as the judgment proceeds, what would this look like? We have to recognize both positive and negative outcomes. I'll start with the negative. You see multiple places, Daniel 12 comes to mind, people awakening to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the resurrection that they look forward to and anticipate. They awake to shame. Jesus talks about people coming before him and he speaks to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Or him proclaiming to them that they will, be, they will face unquenchable, unquenchable fire. They will be cast out into outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. 
So the outcome of the judgment, uh, go back in your mind and the imagery, a king sitting upon a white throne, the entire world gathered before him and his judgment made some to righteousness, some to shame and everlasting contempt. How would, turning to the positive, how would there be judgment to the positive? Well, you see some implications of this. For instance, Romans 2 will give you both sides. Everyone who does evil faces judgment and condemnation. But to everyone who does good, there will be glory and honor and peace, and God will give eternal life, Romans 2, 7 and 10. Other places where Jesus says believers will be justified, or I think the idea is vindicated by their words. 1 Corinthians 4, each person will receive his commendation from God. And again, the idea is not that God sitting upon his throne or Jesus sitting upon his throne looks out and kind of, mm, kind of tries to balance, well, were their works more good or more bad? I mean, the decision is absolute. He knows all things. And so he simply declares what it will be. But I think the picture of it is not that he's deciding whether to give eternal life or not, but that he is confirming. He is declaring. He is uh, making it very clear for all. This person stands righteous before me. And of course, where we'll continue with this concept in a bit is to recognize that it is the righteousness of Christ and Christ alone that could be the basis for anyone being declared innocent. Remember the whole framework for how Romans presents the gospel, but really the entire New Testament, that our righteousness is not our own. But that Jesus would declare people righteous, he has declared every believer righteous. I have been declared righteous already. And in the future judgment, it will just be a confirmation of that, a restatement again. For the benefit of all there and all who hear, this person is righteous. And that is part, again, of the judgment. That actually, though, raises another question, and the, the next question is related to what we were just talking about. Uh, the question goes, well, okay, so when is this judgment going to happen? Because if you're thinking through this framework that I just said, it sounds like there's a judgment, and both righteous and wicked are there, and Jesus condemns the wicked, and Jesus confirms or justifies or vindicates the righteous to declare that they are, in fact, righteous. It sounds like they're all there together, and yet I read elsewhere of the judgment seat of Christ. I read of believers not facing judgment. So how does this fit together? How does this work? And we ought to talk then about a little bit about the chronology of the events. When we're talking about the judgment, what do these events look like and how do they fit together? I'll start by reading what I would call the core passage for the judgment, and it's Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no place found for them. And verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works." Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. A number of significant details that fit in and help us put this passage in context and, and understand it fully. Let's begin first by just understanding how this fits in the context of Revelation or the chronology of future events. How do all of the future events fit together to begin with? So we've looked at this diagram before and just use this as an attempt to understand the basic framework for the coming judgment. And you can recognize that there are multiple events or multiple stages in this process, what we see as we think of the coming judgment. So that we see the tribulation, then the millennium, and the final rebellion, and the new heavens and the new earth, eternity. The passage that we were just considering in Revelation 20 would make some of this chronology fairly clear. So in that passage, it describes the final victory, chapter 19, 
And then a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of chapter 20. And it's following that thousand year reign that you see a final rebellion where Satan again attempts to rebel against God and, and to try to overthrow his reign. It's following that final rebellion right here and before the new heavens and the new earth, apparently, that we see the description of the judgment. And if that's the framework that we use here, then the most natural reading of it would be that the judgment falls here, that the judgment to come is this event connected or just right after the final rebellion. If then that's the framework, we start to ask some other questions because it does start to get a bit more complicated. And you can recognize, for instance, that there are descriptions of other judgments in Scripture. So we've already seen some of them. Believers coming, for instance, before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not judgment in the sense of them being the possibility of them being condemned. It's a separate and very different kind of judgment described as giving account, giving an account to God for their faithfulness and the different ways that he asked or that he expected of them to serve him. Or you see something similar with the judgment of angels. Believers will judge angels and it, we would assume we would think that somehow the, the judgment of unbelievers would be separate from this a giving account for believers, and that itself would be separate from the judgment of angels, since believers are part of the judging of angels. In other words, there are enough differences here that we can look at these judgments and have a sense that they are separate judgments, or seem to be, rather than just one. The thing, though, is that there's no clear biblical framework for telling us when each one of these events would happen. And some interpreters have looked at some of the things I just mentioned and other factors. And putting some of that together, they've asked if possibly, maybe we're looking at different judgments uh, where we might expect, say, a judgment of believers, the judgment seat of Christ, following the rapture. Because if all believers are removed from the earth, then perhaps we stand together and we face judgment immediately at that moment on the assumption that we are glorified now. And so this giving of account must be wrapped up together with the event or the initial receiving of our glorified bodies. Questions come to mind, though, because we continue to have believers and believers throughout this era, people that are newly trusting in Christ. And so someone who trusts in Christ during that era, when would they be judged? Uh, presumably, do you have another judgment seat of Christ again later on for those people? I, I don't know. If we were going to talk about unbelievers being judged, most interpreters agree that that would fall here following the final rebellion. But some interpreters have divided this out, and some of them even have divided out a, a judgment of unbelieving Israel from unbelieving Gentiles or unbelieving Old Testament believers, or excuse me, be, un, uh, Old Testament believers and Old Testament unbelievers separate from people in the New Testament. I would say that in general, I'm fairly uncomfortable with all of those kinds of distinctions, partially simply because we, we don't know. And that's where I'm going to go here. The closest I can come here to an answer about the timing of the judgment or some kind of effort at understanding how possibly these pieces could fit together. You'll notice going back to this diagram again, that Daniel talks about some kind of transition period, a period of 45 days around this period when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. And there's a possibility that some of the judgments might be happening in this period because we have a 45 day period of kind of things being set right somehow. So is that possibly part of the equation? I could imagine that being true. Beyond that, I don't really have any other biblical indication of timing or a framework or this judgment coming here and these people judging there, being judged at there and at that time. And I would prefer simply to say that we do not know. My strongest suspicion is that the bulk of the judgment or most of these judgments 
are happening around this period because it is connected to Revelation 20, that following the millennium and the final rebellion, this is really when I expect most of the judgment to happen. And beyond that, I don't really know. And I don't know that scripture makes it possible for me to be so clear about either the timing or how separate each one of these events is. Two other questions. The questions go, what, are the, what is the judgment based on? And also, what is the purpose of God's judgment? So let's start with this. What is the basis of the judgment? Or what is the foundation upon which this judgment stands? We can pull together a lot of information from across Scripture to recognize that God does judge people according to their works or that he holds them accountable based on how they have lived. And we're going to find language here about God's judging the righteous versus his judging the wicked. So here is uh, an attempt to put this into table form. Daniel 12, talking about those being resurrected to shame and everlasting contempt, contrasted with those who are wise and those who turn many to righteousness. Jesus talking about the chaff or the weeds versus the wheat. That's illustrative language, but it's giving the sense of someone who's worthy or righteous. The evil versus the righteous. The goats versus the sheep. Those who have done evil facing the resurrection of judgment. Those who have done good facing, facing the resurrection of life. And finally, those who worship the beast versus the saints or the holy ones. That kind of distinction is clear enough to say. There are differences in character. There is difference in the nature of the person or their righteousness. And that judgment, the judgment is based then on those differences of a person's nature or of their character. Now, that might contrast with something else that immediately hits your mind, which is that might sound a little bit more like a Muslim view of judgment or of a works righteousness kind of judgment. In other words, the assumption that God will look at our works and there will be people who are relatively righteous and people who are relatively wicked, and so God judging out or kind of balancing the good versus the bad comes to a conclusion, okay, this person is more righteous than wicked, therefore they inherit eternal life. And, and that, of course, is not fitting into the pattern of Scripture, so that we can walk through multiple passages that make it very clear the way that anyone will stand up in judgment is strictly and only based on their relationship with Jesus Christ. Just to make that clear, let's look at some passages. Jesus says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. He will not come into condemnation. That's a judgment word. This person cannot face that judgment because he's heard my words and he's believed. John 3.18, He that believeth on him, on Jesus, is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, there is someone who will judge him. The word that I have spoken, that will judge him on the last day. But it's all predicated, it's all linked to rejecting Jesus, receiving not Jesus' words. So the only standard of judgment is, it's very simple. Do you accept Jesus and his words? That is the basis of judgment. Okay, well, fair enough and both clear enough. But the question goes then, how do I put these together? I mean, actually, I'll just swing back the other direction and I'm going to show you another and final set of passages that show you that judgment comes based on people's works. And very explicitly and very clearly, the earlier passages we saw more were on their character. Who are they as people? But here are direct passages that talk about being judged based on what you did. So, First Peter, if you call on Father, on, on God as Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every person's work, how will we be judged based on our works? Revelation 20, 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written according to their works. 
And Jesus says, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And one other passage I did not include here, but Romans 2 talks about God rendering to every man according to his works. So to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. To them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, for the Jew first, also the Gentile. People will be judged according to their works. And that, that leaves us with a bit of a mental tension or a bit of a question. How do we put these together? How do I understand how they could relate? Actually, there's one other uh, pattern I neglected to show you or forgot to bring up here, and that is the pattern of the books. This is worth noting as well. Just watch the, the pattern of the books being open. Judgment was set. The books were open. What's written in these books? Well, in Daniel 12, everyone that would be found written in the book would be delivered. So it's a sense of if you're written, you have life. And here, whose names are in the book of life. Here it is, the name written in the book of life. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, talking about worshiping the Antichrist. Here is the book of life from the foundation of the world. And finally, the passage we just read, Revelation 20, the books were opened. Here's the book of life. They're judged according to what is written in the books, according to their works. Here's the book of life. Here's the Lamb's book of life. So all of that emphasis to say that the judgment is not partial. It's not arbitrary. It's not ambiguous. It's not as though the Father or God is or Jesus, or that he's looking at this, this judgment and he's kind of trying to decide. It's clear. It's objective that's written in the book of life is your name there or another way of saying it all of the deeds that someone has committed written in these books it's clear okay but i don't know how to put those pieces together then <laughs> is it my being judged according to my works which sounds a bit more like islam or is it my judge ju the judgment being according to my faith in jesus and here I'm going to give several important qualifications that help us understand or put these pieces together. Number one, a foundation of this is that we are judged according to our works. Well, one of the most critical things that scripture demands that we do is to believe in Jesus Christ alone. In other words, I wouldn't exactly say that this is salvation by works or that you're going to be uh, justified based on your good deeds, but I will say you are justified based on what you do. One of the things, well, the thing that will make the difference of your being justified, did you or did you not believe in Jesus Christ? And it's not that you in that earn your salvation by doing a good work, but it is one of your actions. And it is one of the things that God, it is what God holds you into account for. Did you or did you not believe on him as he commanded and as was only right, the salvation he offered to us. There is also a sense of the works being critical in this judgment because it's a confirmation for those who stand condemned. In other words, no one can come before God and say, you can't condemn me. I was a good guy. I was a nice guy. I, I did all the right things. How can you command, condemn me? Okay, I never believed on Jesus, but, but I was still nice. And part of the condemnation is that God can bring before people, well, here is what is actually written, and here is the reality of your life. And no, you weren't. I mean, you weren't righteous enough. You did commit sin and you did resist and suppress the truth that you knew. Third, we can recognize that the specific focus of these passages is on really the condemnation for an unbeliever, that, that an unbeliever faces this condemnation and their works are the foundation on which they stand condemned. And part of the reason I point this out 
is that there is a, an asymmetry between these. The passages that talk about unbelievers being condemned by their works, there's a stronger emphasis there and not a corresponding emphasis on the other side to say that believers earn their salvation based on their good works. There are passages that talk about being justified based on what you did, and I would put that in the category of based on your faith in Christ. But there's a stronger emphasis here on the side of condemnation. And I do think that's part of the idea that it is by people's failure or their disobedience that they stand condemned. But actually, the last idea is the most important to me. And this is the center of how I would put these passages or these ideas together. It's the concept that regeneration, faith in Christ, true justification leads inexorably, absolutely, it must lead to real living, the true fruit of righteousness lived out in a person's life. So that a core part of having truly been justified is that you do it, that you obey, that you follow after Christ. It's the fruit of justification lived out. Regeneration is confirmed when we, and, and we confirm that we have been justified when we carry out righteous acts. And those righteous acts then become the proof, not the reason, but the proof that we have been truly justified. I think that's probably the basis on which scripture will say that people will be justified or condemned based on their works. It's possible for God to point even to the results, what we might call the fruit of the Spirit in a person's life, as proof that something miraculous happened and the demonstration that the justification in their life was real. The final question I want to talk about then is the purpose of God's judgment. And there are reasons that scripture emphasizes God's judgment, reasons that this is important for us to understand, and that it actually helps, us helps to motivate us or helps us to be more faithful in our obedience to God. So I'm gonna give you first, I'm gonna give you a total of four reasons, but starting with this, the concept of the coming judgment and the reason that scripture describes it at such length is that it motivates believers to live faithfully. It is biblically part of God's speaking to us and showing us why we must follow him, what we ought to do in order to be faithful. And Romans 14 will describe this. Romans 14 reminds us that we, Romans 14, 10, we must not judge our brothers, we must not set it not our brothers, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, this judgment, this coming judgment, becomes a motivation for loving one another. Matthew 7, do not judge, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. With what measure you meet, you will be measured. it will be measured to you. Again, the concept is not that we can never have a conclusion about another person. Actually, other passages call us to be sensible and aware. But it is the notion that we cannot be hypocritical because that judgment will come back. There will be a future judgment and we will stand accountable. Similar logic, 2 Corinthians 5, we labor that we might be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is motivation for believers. If you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges every man according to his work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Again, spoken to believers, but with the motivation that judgment is real. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. And the following context here is to say, preach the word. Proclaim the truth faithfully. Why? Because God will judge the living and the dead. In other words, it's gone off a little bit in our thinking. If our conclusion is, as a believer, I'll never face judgment. I have nothing to fear. And therefore, I don't need to worry about the theme of judgment. I should not be fearful of the coming judgment. On the contrary, there is a legitimate motivation here. God will judge, God will hold into account. That motivates believers to be faithful. There are other questions that might come to your mind with that. I will talk about that further next time.
And it is a complex question. Will believers face judgment or are we through the cross and through justification, are we now guaranteed to be free from judgment? Well, that's a topic I wanna to talk about further, but I'll just leave it here to say for now that scripture does motivate us using the judgment. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Be careful, be faithful. That is part of scripture's framework. A second purpose for judgment is that it motivates unbelievers to repent. So you're going to find this concept as well across Scripture. Both Jesus and the apostles will emphasize the idea that judgment is coming. Remember, Jesus saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's at the core, really, of his preaching. Well, even there, his concept is that when the kingdom of heaven comes, you will be held to account. He warns elsewhere, already the axe is laid at the foot of the tree. Already the judgment is coming. The judgment is at hand. Are you ready? And if you continue that out from Jesus' teaching to the apostles, you find the apostles also warning, Acts 2, Peter saying that judgment is at hand. You must repent now. Okay, Judgment becomes a major reason for unbelievers to repent. Or a final passage, Psalm 2, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way his wrath is quickly kindled. Accept the son now, because he will judge you. But I'm going to give you two final answers, and this will take us all the way back around to our starting question. I asked at the beginning, uh, uh, if you're having a conversation with a person, and the person's argument goes, I can't believe in a God who would judge people like this. I, I would believe in a God who's merciful and gracious and just kind of lets things go. But a God who judges for sin, is that's too much. I can't do that. I understand the thought. I understand the thought because this is part of our human thinking. We would like everything to just be set aside. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It'll be all right. I'll let it go. And we would prefer that naturally enough. But is that really true to the nature of God and to his character? Remember back to our concept that we traced all the way through scripture from the very beginning. God warns of judgment. And, and we see places where, for instance, Exodus 34, God reveals his nature. Okay, here is the mercy side of this. God keeps steadfast love for thousands. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. But listen to the last part of the statement. This is a core statement revealing who is God. He will by no means clear the guilty. God is not a God who just says, oh, don't worry about it. He does forgive sin, but he will by no means clear the guilty. And you could scratch your head if you just read that passage alone. Wait, how can he be a God who both forgives sin and will by no means clear the guilty? As you continue through the Old Testament, you see this concept that God is holy, that he's just, that he's righteous, that he must deal with sin, and that he's also gracious. And you're, you're kind of set out here with a question that, doesn't have an answer as you read across the Old Testament. Well, there are hints of an answer already for sure. But you're not sure how this would fit together, how he can both be righteous and forgive people for their sins. And in fact, it gets a little thicker than that still, because it's the recognition that for him not to judge sin would itself be a denial of his holiness and his justice. At Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How then could God forgive sins? And the resolution that you have to know moving into the gospel is that the only way this is possible is for his justice to be poured out and exhausted on a single person. That in Jesus Christ, all of the wrath of God is poured out. It's exhausted so that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And that makes it possible, Romans 3, that God would both be righteous and be able to declare people righteous. That God can forgive sins without denying his own nature. That God can both be holy 
and merciful, that both can be true at the same time. And what you discover then is that the, the question the person raised is a, a legitimate in a sense. I mean, because what they're saying is, I, I would expect or I would think that God could be merciful and, and that God would just forgive sins. They're sort of right. God can and God will and God does desire to forgive sins. But it's not all as simple as that. The, God would just say, don't worry about it, forget about it, don't let it be a problem, it's no big deal. To do that would be unjust. How can sins be forgiven? Only if someone steps in and carries the payment for that sin. If someone suffers for the sin the way I ought to face it myself. There's another issue that is closely related. And surrounding this same question of justice, we ought to recognize that there's another reason for the final judgment, and that is that there is a natural longing in human hearts for justice to be served. Okay, I want you to just think, as you think across human history, recognize how many times the, the weak and the helpless, the powerless, have faced horrible torture, suffering, sorrow, or injustice. And this is the story of humanity, again, all the way back to Genesis 4. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, the next event we read about is that Cain, who offers a, 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 or Abel, who offers a righteous sacrifice to God, is killed by Cain. In other words, the righteous dies, the wicked overcomes. And that story just carries itself out across the rest of the Old Testament. Later in the same chapter, then you read about one of Cain's descendants, and he's bragging about how he has been even more wicked than Cain. You can go now to the flood, and you can see people that are full of, if the earth is full of violence and bloodshed, and, and you can walk through the story of the Old Testament, even Habakkuk struggling to say, how can people that are more wicked than we come in and conquer us? So why are we suffering and suffering the judgment of God when these people are more wicked than we are? And there's a cry that comes out of our hearts to say, how long? This is not right. How long, O oh Lord? Ecclesiastes talks about it. In, even in the place of justice, in the place of righteousness, even in the court, even in the place where law, the law should be followed and justice should be served, or even in houses of worship, churches, even in these places, there is still corruption. And the sorrow or the struggle of the human heart is to say, when will this be set right? Two answers that come to that. Number one, we should recognize that in the end, only God and only divine wisdom could take the mess of our sin and the history of human fallenness and untangle it all and set things right. Only God could work that out. To give you one illustration of this, the incidents that happened in World War II, particularly in Europe, and uh, Nazi occupation, some of these questions are still being worked out today. What I mean by that is some of the guards are still being found. I just, speaking in, in February 2021, I just read last week of a 95-year-old former Nazi guard that was recently found. Well, some of the victims still live. Some of the guards still live. And so people are still trying to serve justice for crimes that were committed 70 years ago. And in fact, it's worse. Some of the assets that were taken by Nazi looters during the time, they would steal artwork, they would take money, and they would just murder an entire Jewish family, take all of their assets and commit that to the Nazi government. Well, how now is that going to be set right? And so there are still lawsuits worked out where descendants of some of the people who died now are trying to sue the government to try to get some of that property back. But if it's been in the family of this person for now 70 years, and how, if it was bought or sold, how do you serve justice? You can't work all this out. 
There's no way to untangle all of the injustice. And in other cases, people who did terrible things have already died. They lived comfortable lives and they died and they never faced justice for what they did. And one question I would ask back to a person who asks like this, why God does not just let sin go, will there never be justice for these things? I mean, will a person like Adolf Hitler never face justice for what he did? Because he died before he could come to any kind of account. Did he get away with that? And is that fair and is that right for the innocent sufferers or those who suffered underneath Hitler's domination? Is there any justice that will be served? And I think part of what's going on here is as you and I face the injustices of life on a broken planet, there will eventually be justice served. God alone could untangle all of this, and he will. But together with that, we're grateful that this justice served will not be without mercy. And it's that final reminder that mercy is only and strictly won through the cross. Just to conclude our time then here as we think through these topics, I'd like to highlight that the topic of justice stands at the center of the gospel. We can move from the future justice, we can move from the justice of God, we can recognize how there is no other resolution with his mercy. It's not as simple as just saying, can he forget about it all? Not even for the sake of the humans that face it. The humans themselves would want to have justice served. Those who suffered look at what they suffered and cry out for justice. It's not as simple as just saying, let's not worry about it. But there is a solution. And the solution is that mercy is possible. Because the wrath of God has been poured out already on his son. We can be forgiven because of the cross. And as you then think of judgment and justice and looking forward even to the future when every one of us stands before God, here is the foundation and here is the reminder. Even this event, justice and judgment, absolutely and entirely points to the center of judgment and justice. The moment when in all eternity, the greatest outpouring of judgment happened. This was it. God's total and complete judgment for all of the sins of all of the world poured out in a moment on his son. The future judgment is just one echo of the greater reality, the ultimate judgment centered at the cross. When we come back next time, the final set of questions we will discuss will be just understanding how it's still true that believers face a kind of judgment. Will we face judgment or are we free from judgment? Is there still a judgment seat of Christ or can we still be condemned for our sins? And how do we understand these pieces together? How also does it drive our lives that we might be faithful in all of our choices?